Meg McKenzie, and I'm the director of the School for International Studies. Thanks for joining us for this information session on um, our master's program. And we hope that we can share some information and get you excited about the program and answer any questions you have. I just wanna acknowledge that I'm joining you today from unceded indigenous lands, the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and I also wanna acknowledge, you know, I'm watching the news this morning. I know many of you are, and I know there's many conflicts going on in the world right now, but you know, I just wanna especially um, extend solidarity with those who um, are also watching the news of what's going on in, in, um, the Ga in Gaza right now. And I, I think it's important anytime we gather right now to just uh, raise awareness about what's going on and, and at least acknowledge um, that situation. So um, welcome and uh, we're very excited to um, share information about our awesome program. I, uh, it's Jason Stearns is gonna take over, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have later on. Thanks, Megan. Um, welcome to everybody. It's nice to, to, to see you, or I guess I don't see you, you see me, but nice to greet you here in this informational session about our Masters of Arts. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through uh, around 11 or 12 slides, I think, that give you a brief overview of the program, its structure, what sets us apart, I think, from other programs in international studies, um, some of the career paths that people can follow coming out of this program, and some of the more logistical information about how to get admitted or how to apply to the program, funding, and so on. I'll try to be brief. Uh, we're lucky also to have uh, two, two people, two students who have gone through the program. Uh, Talia and Opiemi join us uh, today, which is great because they can give you, I think, probably better view than I can about what the program is actually like for a student. So I'm going to hand over to them afterwards. And then we have, uh, I think, hopefully still about half an hour at that time to have question and answers, uh, just to really address some of your questions about the program as well. So um, what with that in mind, what do we offer? What is the Master's uh, International Studies at Simon Fraser University? Well, that's the building. I'm not there now. I'm at an airport <laughs> in Chicago, but that is the building where we, um, where our classes are, most of our classes are held in downtown Vancouver. It's a downtown campus in Vancouver. Um, what really sets us apart, I think, is multidisciplinarity. And what I mean by that is if you look at our faculty, and I'm gonna introduce them I'm going to go through at least who our core faculty are. We come from all kinds of disciplines. And so not only are, do we have faculty from all kinds of disciplines, from social sciences, I'm a political scientist, as is Megan, but we have also anthropologists, sociologists um, uh, as well in, in the program. And, uh, and not just do we have people from different disciplines, but a lot of our work, my work, Megan's work, is, multi is interdisciplinary. And so you you get a, a really wide range of classes when, you know, I'm going to go through some of the classes as well. So I think that sets, a, sets us apart. We work on a host of different regions. I work on Central Africa, on the Democratic Republic of Congo, mostly. Um, other scholars that we have work on Latin America, on the Middle East, on East Asia and South Asia. So we have people focusing all kinds of geographic regions and many different uh, expertise and focus. I think one of the the real luxuries that students in our program have, well, at least Talia and OPME can can contradict me if I'm wrong, but it's the it's a very small cohort. I, I did an international studies program when I was much younger, many years ago, and it was 300 people in the program. And so this is the cohorts. Our cohorts are usually between I would say 14 and 18 students, sometimes a little larger, sometimes a little smaller, usually a little smaller actually. Um, and so that's almost as many professors, core professors, as we have in the program. And so you can really get very individualized attention, easy access to the professors, very small classes. Um, the program is 12 to, four, uh, 12 to 24 months long, and that depends on how you split it up, whether you do a co-op or not, whether you decide to do field research or not, and other things. There is potential for significant tuition su uh, support, and we can talk more about this in the question and answer. Um, but um, it, it depends on the students. Basically, we, we we treat each we assess each student individually. Top students can get grants of up to ten to twenty thousand dollars. And of course, if you do well in the program and if you get 
uh, get good grades. There are possibilities for research assistantships and teaching assistantships um, at the school. I think that uh, that are quite quite uh, quite easy to get at least for top students. Um, and then we have also professional development opportunities that I'll go into a little bit as well. So that's sort of a summary of what the master's program offers. And here are the people who actually animate who uh, this program. These are my colleagues in, in the program. And I'll start here. And I think it's important for students to know who these people are because these are the faculty that you would be engaging with if you join our program. And so much, I think, about the program is defined really by, by us, by who we are. Um, and so starting from the top left on the screen is Tamar Mustafa. Tamar uh, is a professor in the program. He studies law, society, religion, with a focus on Egypt and Malaysia. And then there's Megan, Megan McKenzie, uh, who is the director of, uh, of the school. Uh, Megan is a feminist scholar who works on armies and militaries uh, around the world, international security. Um, Chris Gibson is next. Uh, he is a sociologist who works on Brazil and Latin America, social movements and health policy in Brazil in particular. Nicole Jackson is a scholar of security studies in Central Asia. Uh, Brenda Leishog uh, is a teaching professor who works on, uh, she's a political theorist who works on many issues, including humanitarian intervention. Um, Nazanin Sharokni is our, uh, our newest professor in the program. She is a scholar of the Middle East, in particular Iran, um, uh, Iran but, uh, and other countries in the Middle East, and works on gender, um, uh, feminism, gen uh, uh, feminist geographies um, of, of the Middle East. Then on the lower row, starting from the left, is Gerardo Otero, who is a scholar of social movements, in Latin America uh, and has worked a lot on nutrition and neoliberalism uh, in Mexico in particular. Irene Pang is, uh, uh, works on East Asia and South Asia, on China and India in particular, on labor rights and citizenship uh, in those countries. Then there's me. I work on conflict and social movements in the African continent with the focus on the Democratic Republic of Congo. Darren Byler is an anthropologist. Uh, the gentleman with the glasses there next to me is uh, a, an anthropologist who works, um, who's, much of his work until now has been on China, uh, on Xinjiang province, but he is now increasingly working on surveillance. That's his initial work is in China and surveillance, um, surveillance capitalism. Uh, and now he's doing a lot of this kind of work uh, across uh, in, in a um, comparative level uh, with his latest work on Malaysia. And then Liz Cooper works on uh, East Africa uh, with the, she's an anthropologist focusing on health and education uh, in, in East Africa. So I'm sure I've gotten, I've gotten glossed very quickly over people who've done many different works and I'm sure I haven't uh, done everything, but their profiles are on the website. Uh, I really do encourage you if you're interested in the program to dig into a little bit into the professors because a lot of what you get out of the program is your engagement with, with the professors. The structure of the program, how are we structured? So um, there's typically two terms, fall and spring. Uh, we Almost all students arrive in the fall and it's actually quite important for students to arrive in the fall. They then form part of a cohort, a group of students who move through the program together. So the fact that they all start together is important. And also the way the program is structured in terms of which classes you take first is important. So one class, the class, there's a, a logic to the program Program and the program starts in the fall for a reason. So you go from the uh, fall and the spring with full-time coursework in both those semesters. And then in a third term, which students can, which is usually uh, a summer term in which students can complete their final essays or conduct research toward a thesis. Um, they can also use that third term, the summer term as a co-op term to gain paid work experience, which is why the program can be 12 months, but it can also be much longer than that, depending on how you use that summer, summer, um, that summer term. Um, and so that can then prolong your studies as well. And we'll get into the co-op in a second. That picture, incidentally, is not of our downtown campus, but that's the main SFU campus up in Burnaby. Uh, SFU has several campuses across Vancouver. The main one that um, that the master's, the May students, the master's students would be visiting is the downtown campus, but they may also, they could also take classes in other departments across the SFU system and actually across the system uh, in other universities in British, uh, in, in Vancouver as well, but mostly at SFU. So here are the core classes in our program that are required to that you required to take. 
uh, for the MACE program. So you would enter in the fall and you take uh, IS 800, which is a class um, that is uh, tries to teach students uh, really how to, to read and write like an international um, studies expert. So they we do things like teach students how to write opinion pieces, policy papers, literature reviews, briefing papers. Um, and that is then a preparatory class for what comes on afterwards, which is then digging deeper into what interests them for their, either their extended essays or their thesis. IS 801 is a class on institutions, policies, and, and development. And then there's an elective course as well. So that's the fall semester. And the spring semester, uh, IS 830, Analytic Approaches for International Studies. Um, this is then the, the methods class, if I'm not mistaken, um, which is taught, again, as part of the sequence is preparing students for the extended essays for their research, be it in the extended essays or in the thesis, which comes in, in the summer. Uh, and that is grappling with quantitative methodologies as well as qualitative methodologies. IS-806, which is what I usually teach, is a class on states and understanding how states work, both their how, why states fail, how they're constructed in the long term, um, as well as crises now in terms of state failure. And there's an elective uh, courses uh, as well then in the spring. Um, if you do the thesis, then you actually have a thesis course in the spring. You don't take the elective course. You don't have to take the elective course. So then in the summer come either the extended essays or the thesis. And this is how the program is, is built. So students have a choice of either doing to complete the program to do two extended essays, which are long essays. They can be literature review, literature review essays, they can be research essays, they can be policy essays, but they're essentially long essays. Usually they don't require students to do field research, they don't require students to travel, or they can do a thesis, which usually requires students to do original data collection. Um, sometimes students travel. We have a student currently with us in the program, finishing the program now, who did fantastic field research in Ghana on social movements. So that's a great example of uh, how students can um, then get funding from the program to pursue some of their passions and interests to write a thesis. Or, as I mentioned before, students can take advantage of the summer to do a co-op and get a placement in a co-op, which can help further their own career and give them a foothold in uh, in British Columbia in terms of understanding what working in British Columbia is like. Um, and then uh, in the fall, then, depending on what you did in the summer, um, you could finish your extended essays or, or your thesis. Um, so here's some examples of the extended essays or thesis. Um, the, uh, the, there's a, the police reform in Nigeria, critical examination of implementation of community policing. Um, uh, the I'm not going to go through all the titles. You can read them yourself here. The one that the Alexander, our, our student that I mentioned, who worked on Ghana now, he wrote a thesis that's on social movements in Ghana, trying to understand the successes and failures of contemporary social movements in Ghana. That's another great example of a thesis. But you can see here sort of the difference. It's the two extended essays. It comes out to about the same amount of words. But uh, the, the extended essays are each 8,000, whereas the thesis is up to 16,000 words. And with the thesis, you actually do uh, an oral defense. You sit together with professors and you then explain your thesis and we ask questions. Whereas the extended essays, you submit them and they're rigorously reviewed, but there's no actual defense in, in, in person. So here I thought, uh, Ellen, if you're there, I would let you talk a little bit about the co-op because you're a better place to do so than I am. But this is what I said could happen in the summer of the year after you enter into the program uh, in the co-op. Uh, Ellen, are you are you there? I am, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so thanks, Jason. Uh, so co-op is basically experiential learning, uh, which integrates your academic studies with relevant work experience, at least, you know, ideally. Uh, and you can see here, these are the example placements that our students have, you know, um, been placed within. Um, and just to be fully transparent, um, you know, I do want to make uh, clear here that it is actually very difficult for international students to get any co-op positions with the federal government. So if for international students, they're more likely to get them with, um, you know, sort of with the private sector, uh, in which case, it, you know, the positions may or may not be related to your studies as much. 
Um, but it is still good sort of work experience because um, from our experience, many students actually want to stay on post-graduation. And, you know, and so the Canadian work experience is quite um, crucial, basically. Uh, students would also typically only start co-op um, once they've completed coursework. So it's not possible to, say, do the fall term and then do co-op next one. So you would do the fall and spring semester. From then on, co-op is... Um, fair game if you join the program. Um, and so the idea is to alternate work terms with study terms. So sometimes students will, let's say, do a co-op in the summer and then continue with their um, you know, academic progress in the fall term or even the other way around. Um, and this is also a paid service. So I do wanna be transparent there as well. Um, the, the application fee to join is about 150 for Canadians and about 400 for international students. And there is still tuition um, that must be paid when students are in co-op placements. And it's about 800. So it's actually not that high in terms of cost. Um, yeah, so I, if I may then pass it to Talia because she is somebody who uh, is one of our graduates from the program. She has participated in co-op so that she can kind of provide her firsthand experience. Thanks, Talia. For sure, thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, I had the uh, privilege of participating in a co-op placement in my summer semester of my uh, first year round in the MAIS program. And I ended up working with um, IRCC or Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. Um, I found the the whole co-op experience, it was something I didn't do in my undergrad, so it was new to me here in my graduate studies, um, but the department is uh, so supportive in it, and the co-op office um, was really integral in helping me sort of secure this position, and it gives you really amazing skills at even just like resume and cover letter writing. Um, they will happily review things with you and give you tips and feedback on how to refine things. Um, the co-op office has seen students get placed all over the province. Um, so they have really great expertise to be able to help you there. And my co-op placement actually was able to branch into just regular employment after the fact. Um, and it was really great. And I would not have been able to get that foothold in the federal government if I had not had this opportunity through co-op. Um, so I am incredibly appreciative for that opportunity. And it's a job that I, I've left now, but I have the opportunity to go back to at any point. And it really helped give me that standing, as Jason said, of kind of understanding what it's like to work here in the force in British Columbia and to get that that foothold. So um, I would certainly recommend co-op to anybody who who is interested. Thanks, Alan. Awesome. Um, so we can field some more questions about all of this at the end, uh, including the co-op, but let me just uh, try to get through the rest of the presentation. So many potential applicants are interested in, in what they can become at, what will this help them do in terms of the further career? And I think the easiest way of answering that question is looking at some of the people who graduated. Luckily, we have Talia and Opie with us today who are heading in that direction at the moment, but other graduates from the program have done many different things. Many people stay on in Canada and get jobs in Canada, um, uh, working for a whole variety of local organizations, NGOs, private sector, the federal government, the provincial government. Um, we have, there's a, you can read yourself here on, on the slide what some others uh, have done. The MasterCard Foundation, which is uh, a, a huge foundation based in Toronto. We have numerous graduates going on to work for the United Nations. Um, many of them working for the Canadian federal government. Uh, Benedicta, you can see here on the slide, is a recent graduate, for example. She's now working for uh, an NGO here in, in Vancouver. And so there's really a, a wide variety of different places that students can go on to, to work in. We'd be happy to answer some more questions about that if you do have those as well. How do you apply? Uh, it's all on the website. So I would, if you have any questions with regards to the application, I would go to just just Google SFU International Studies, and you'll see uh, you'll see our website, and it's pretty clearly marked how to apply. And so all of this information I'm about to give you here, and that we're going to post on our YouTube channel, is also on the our website. Um, the key thing to re remember here is that the the intake opens with a portal is uh, actually open, I guess, already. 
And, but the deadline is January 5th. And so that, that you have to apply before January 5th. And so it's useful if you are intending to apply to go there to make sure you have all the materials you need to get, uh, uh, get your ducks in a row, get all the materials you need well before that deadline. Uh, so there's recommendation letters for many international students. There's English proficiency exams uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we, um, I've been on the admissions committee several times. Grades do help us assess, certainly not the only thing that we look at, but grades do help us assess applicants. Uh, applicants uh, normally have a bachelor's degree. It's not a requirement of having at least 3.5 GPA or the equivalent from a recognized university. Obviously we convert uh, universities outside of Canada. We have to convert many of their uh, grading scales to our grading scale. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, 3.5 is what we start looking at. It can be lower if there's other things to compensate for that, but usually it has to be at around a 3.5, and it has to be within a social science or an arts discipline. We will then try to get back to you about the decision uh, in late February or, or early March. Uh, or rather, we will make decisions. We will, we will reach out to those who have been accepted in late February and early March. And so there you go. There's the uh, the link again. This will all be posted on our YouTube channel, uh, and you can find it very easily on our website. But there's a link that you can go to uh, to find the application form. You need it's very straightforward. You need a CV, a one page letter of intent, statement of research interest, um, which really should give us an indication uh, that you are doing something that is relevant to our program that actually jives with something that one of our faculty is is doing and that you're able to formulate a cogent and feasible research proposal it's just a it's a one page statement it's not a an, it's it's not a it's not a, a lengthy research proposal but it should give us an indication of those things an academic writing sample uh, we don't specify the length of the academic writing sample uh, but it should again give us an idea of how well you can write how well you can structure an argument how well you can present an argument, how well you can do uh, things like uh, reference and cite, uh, relevant literature, and so on, so on and so forth. So it can be from really from uh, any relevant academic discipline. It can be of any length, um, but uh, it should give us an idea of what I just what I just mentioned. Contact information for three referees, two of whom should be in university faculty members, and that's important as well because this is an academic program. Um, a copy of transcripts from all institutions attended, um, and we do urge you not to mail a hard copy of, of your transcript at this time, at least. It's so one of the questions we often get is about contacting faculty members. Is it helpful to contact faculty members? Um, we, you are certainly allowed to contact faculty members. It happens. I myself get emails from interested students. We try to answer them, um, but you are not admitted to work with any of us in particular. So if you contact us uh, and you, you want to get in touch with us, you want to get more information, that can be helpful, but it's not something required. And I, and I think uh, a, a majority, a large majority of students who are admitted to our program never have personalized contact with, with the professors. Um, there are additional requirements for international students, so please, for international students, go see the website. The most important thing is the English exam or the proof of English proficiency. And here it is very strict. People who do not reach the minimum score will not be admitted to the program. And so I've listed, you can do a variety of different tests. A TUFL, uh, TUFL is the most frequent test I think that we get, or the IELTS uh, is, is another one. But um, those are required for any student who has completed a degree in an institution where the language of instruction uh, was not in English. And so it's waived for people who did degree in institutions where the language, but but go to the website. Uh, I think on the SFU website, it'll provide you more information. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that it also tells you which country for which countries it's required, uh, the proof of English proficiency is required as well. So there you go, there's the presentation. I thought before we open up for question and answer though, I would briefly hand the mic over to, the virtual mic over to Opiemi perhaps, and then to Talia to talk a little bit about your own experience in the program, maybe just two or three minutes about your experience and what you enjoyed most out of the program. All right, I could go. 
Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So hi everyone. My name is Okoyemi, and uh, I started the program last year. And for me, I think because my background was a little bit interesting because I have a background in economics. So I did a bachelor's in economics, and I also completed a uh, another master's in economics. And so when I was applying for the program, I think something that actually drew me to the program was how interdisciplinary it was. And that was something I was looking for. And I would also say that that's my favorite part of the program. The fact that you're able to take multiple uh, classes that uh, focus on different areas um, and allows you to explore a range of options depending on what you want to focus on after graduating. And another thing uh, for me uh, was the cohort size. And so, because my cohort, we were about, I think, 12 people. And those, like, we went through the entire program together. And I would say, like, that significantly uh, helped me, like, get through most of the classes. Because I was just coming from another master's that was, like, over... 200 people that were admitted and so I didn't even know most of the people in my class it was very hard to actually make that connection uh, but then coming to the international studies program here and having that small cohort size I'm able to talk to people especially when um, I was struggling because like I said my background was a little bit different and so I struggled a little bit in some classes but having people that I could brainstorm with ask questions and also having that um uh one-on-one -on -one interaction with the professors as well significantly um made going through the classes easier for me. And so those I think are uh, are one thing I really value about the international studies program. Yes. Thanks, Obiemi. Uh, her her cohort is amazing. I, her cohort is uh, really offensive. They're, they're real special people. See, they, every cohort has its own dynamic. Uh, and so your cohort was really fantastic, or is, I guess, still really fantastic. Many of you guys are still finishing up. Talia, could I ask you to, to do to engage in a similar sort of reflection about your experience? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I started the program in uh, the fall of 2021 and graduated um, this past June. Um, and I took the thesis track, um, so, and I did co-op. So that's why it took me a little longer to, to go through my program. Um, but... Uh, likewise, to Opie, I think the small cohort was a really key factor of uh, my success in this program. Um, I had gone in my undergrad. It was uh, a very interdisciplinary program, but really small, and it meant there wasn't actually any kind of community or building there. So to come into this program where we are also just coming out of like the depths of the pandemic, my first time back in a classroom, and to be in this room with, I think there were, yeah, like those 12 other students, um, it was really, really important for that ability to make connections and um, to be able to grow and have these people who all came from very different paths to come together and yet yeah, share the experience of the the wins and the struggles of going through a master's because there will certainly be both. Um, but for me, the thing that really drew me to this program was the faculty and knowing who I would have the potential to work with and be able to learn from. And and I, all I found throughout the entire program was that every faculty member in this department is so phenomenally supportive and really just want to see the students succeed. And you saw that whether you were in courses with them or saw them outside at um, events, anything like that. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to work as a TA for most of the program, and that gave me a chance to work with different professors, different faculty members. And I was able to then transition into an RA position, um, which has been just an incredible learning position. And I'm fortunate enough to get to work with Megan here as an RA. And it just shows how supportive the whole faculty is and really wanting to see you move forward. And as I've transitioned out of sort of student life into getting to the post student side of it, um, being able to still have the support from the department has been really phenomenal. So. I think um, for me, that's really what it's been. It's It feels like you're a part of something and like you have this community as you're going through an incredibly important, but also really difficult um, sort of set of studies. And it does just make it so much easier to know that you have the support through it all.
Thanks a lot, Talia. That's that's uh, it's nice to hear. <laughs> it's nice for us to get that feedback too. Thank you very much. Um, so you feel free. I'm going to open up now to questions and answers. Uh, there have been a couple of questions in the chat. Feel free to post your questions in the chat, or you can. I think uh, the procedure was probably to raise your hand, Ellen. Is that probably the best way to do things? Something, and then uh, we can unmute your microphone. Is that how it works? That works for me. Yeah. That, that and, works. Okay. All right. Or something yeah. like that. Let's. It, uh, if I miss some uh, hands, so please just let me know. <laughs> So there's been, I see Ellen's already answered some questions about um, about people from backgrounds who may not be social science. Somebody uh, had as a, a bachelor's in science, mathematics and statistics. I think certainly that kind of background is something that uh, you heard just heard OPME saying she had a background in, in economics. So um, the, it certainly, is, I don't think that's too much of a stretch. I think we look at everybody's application as a whole and we try, we, we read their letters, we read the references, we look at the transcripts, um, uh, and we also really actually pay see what their research interests are and see whether that makes sense for the program. So all of that together, I think, is is, is what we look at. There's another one uh, about uh, ah, that Ellen is also Ellen's very good in the chat there uh, about uh, maybe I'll just I think I think she's answered that one is from a student in Ukraine trying to understand the timing of the admissions. I don't know, Megan. Is there anything? I think you were you heard the our presentation. Is there anything you think that that we missed that you wanted to to add to this while we're waiting for for potential questions to come forward? Uh, I mean, no. I think you did an excellent job, and it's so great to hear from you, Opayemi and Talia. Just to I think give give prospective students a sense of what it's actually like to be a student here. I mean, I just want to reiterate what the students have said and what Jason has said in terms of um the size of the program and how that can really benefit students and you know your access to faculty i think is really unprecedented in terms of at least north american ma programs it's kind of the level of attention and supervision that most phd students still try and get and sometimes don't even get so i think that's that's um something to really um to really keep in mind. And also that we have a very, you know, as, as we mentioned, a very international cohort. So you'll learn from your cohort, you'll learn from your fellow students. Um, so, yeah. Great. Um, there, I know there's some students, some uh, people have joined late. Don't be embarrassed if you feel if you're not sure if something's been addressed or not. We have time for questions now, plenty of time. So if anybody has, any questions, as I said before, you can write them in the chat. I, th I see uh, Enoch has uh, his hand up. Um, I think you can, do we need to unmute him? I think you can unmute yourself, actually. Hello, everyone. We can hear you, yes. Yeah, uh, thank you for this info session. Um, my question revolves around uh, career development. Uh, although you've talked about some people that we could contact just in case we want information about career development, but just for clarity, uh, is there, or let me see, are there resources available for, uh, like resources from SFU uh, for career development and guidance, particularly for students who want to pursue Better career in academia. Thank you. So um, let's see. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you get my question. I got. I got your clear. question. Yes, it's very clear. Yeah. Thank you very, and that's a very good question as well. So, um, we do have a career uh, a career development advisor in 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 our school. I don't know, Ellen. You, you probably better address uh, better to take that question than than I would. You want to take that? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, so we do have a professional development career um, advisor within our department, Catalina Bobandila Sendova. Um, she's fantastic. Um, and she also has an international background. So um, that has, you know, been incredibly uh, valuable in how she guides our students, which, you know, has a high concentration of international students. However, um, so, you know, she can help with things like, um, you know, doing mock interviews with you, um, looking through your CV, 
you know, um, and cover letters and so forth, um, or helping you through presentations. Because some of our current MA students are going through job interviews where they have to conduct a presentation as part of your interview. So she is able to help with all of those. However, for your trajectory for, you know, a career towards academia, I would strongly suggest that you, you know, sort of meet regularly with your senior supervisor, um, because I feel like for the academic path, um, that should be your main guide, basically, uh, for somebody who's actually been through the ropes as well, you know, and ideally, it's somebody who has the expertise in the area you want to focus in, because they could also potentially recommend, um, you know, schools and, you know, faculty members to work with uh, once you finish your MA and would want to go on to a doctoral program. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Yes, please, it does. Thank you. Thanks, Anok. Uh, yeah. I actually don't have anything to add to that. That's a perfect answer. Felix Felix Tete has a question as well. Felix, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, my question again, I think it was misunderstood or probably it wasn't clear enough. Um, I'm a Ghanaian, uh, but a permanent resident in Ukraine. So my question is, I'm in my final year of studies, and then basically I'm graduating in May, June of next year, right? And then I'm looking forward to apply for fall 2024 uh, for this program. Uh, what are my chances of getting admitted, considering the fact that admission decisions will be made uh, before I finally get my final uh, diploma or my final bachelor's from the Ukrainian university? Thank you. Yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, I will just reiterate what Ellen put in the chat. Uh, we, we, we will look at your application. We don't turn down your application because you haven't finished it, if I understand it correctly. In fact, we've admitted students in the past. I think we've been in similar situations. If I'm not mistaken, Ellen, am I, am I way off, off, off base here? I think we've done that in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so it really depends on the quality of your application. If you submit an application and you have stellar grades from a good institution, you um, have great references, but you, you're and in a, you're guaranteed almost to finish next year. You know you stand good chances, I would say. Um, but uh, you know, we, as, so it's not a it's not a knockout blow. It's obviously better to have a degree in hand, but we've admitted many students who do not have their degrees in hand yet. So, does that answer your question, Felix? Yes, thank you very much. No problem. Um, Let's see, was there, Enoch, still... Enoch, do you still have a question? You still have your hand up? No. Uh, Kyle put a, uh, Kyle, I'm going to put, this is the funding question that we, I, I was assuming we were going to get. Do you see that one in the, uh, in the chat, Ellen? I think that one's for you. I do, yeah. Thanks, Kyle, for the great questions. Um, so funding, um, as you know, Dr. Stern says, it is actually not that hard to get funding if you have good grades, uh, particularly if you have good grades once you're in our program. Um, so so don't, you know, for those who whose grades are good, but not exceptional, please don't be, uh, you know, you know, even if you don't get funding in, in the fall term, know that there's always chances for funding down the road. Um, in terms of um, stipend, um, the funding is sort of like a blanket amount. And, you know, we assume students will use it to pay tuition, basically. Um, the money gets deposited into your account actually at SFU. And so, you know, so if let's say you are fortunate to get a GF that's worth $7,000 that gets deposited to your account and you should leave enough to pay for your tuition. But let's say, you know, you can, that cost is about 2000. You can actually take out the rest of the 5,000 to pay for housing or whatever else you need. So we don't actually break down how you use your funding. How you decide to use it is actually up to you. Uh, we do not, unfortunately, offer application waivers, um, and I am conscious that sometimes that's a difficult um, piece for a lot of applicants. But um, you know, but unfortunately, we're just not able to cover it. And and there is also the um, the issue of you know students still have to front quite a bit of money. I I recognize that you know just coming to study in Canada because you're not going to get that pot of money until probably second or third week of September. So I do want to be transparent there again. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question, Kyle. You know, from my experience, the, the you know, I'm obviously not a student in the program, but my, my experience talking to students in the program, the hardest thing is just living expenses in Vancouver. 
you know, the big thing is not actually tuition. We, we can't, we don't guarantee tuitions covered, but many students get a chunk of their tuition covered. Some of them get all of it covered. But Vancouver is an expensive city, and you should know that before you before you come to Vancouver. So students, there are, again, as Alan said, if you do well in the program, there are lots of opportunities, research assistantships, TA ships. Um, so, but but you should do your research in terms of how to how to live in in in, in Vancouver. Uh, we have several other questions, or several other uh, participants have their hands up. I'm going to go to Christoph first. Christoph, you can unmute yourself if you want. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, oh, wonderful. Um, thank you guys first of all for a wonderful presentation. It's so lovely to hear all of you. Um, my question is, um, what do you guys consider when? an applicant is coming in uh, from a fresh master's program, do you have a different set of criteria when looking at such an application? I think I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, that OPME uh, came in with a, with a master's in economics. And right. so I just wanted to know what that process was like and if it was looked at differently. Thank you. You know, again, having done this several times now on the admissions committee, we look at every student for uh, based on their merits. Uh, coming in, so you know, coming with the master's degree, many students come in. I I'm not sure if it's certainly not a majority, but I think many students come in with a master's degree. We've had people come in with PhDs before, which is unusual, uh, but it's happened. And then many come in with just bachelor degrees. So you get all of them. It depends on the quality of the institution. It depends on the quality of the grades. We get students from all over the world. Um, majority of our, the more majority of our applications last year came from, uh, or the plurality came from West Africa, actually. Um, we get many applicants from South Asia and Southeast Asia, um, obviously Canadian and American applicants as well. So we have to look at, we have to do quite a bit of research into the schools that they're coming from. Uh, so I think that is, it, it really, really, really depends on, on, the individual applicant. So yes, having an additional master's helps your application. Um, but you know, if you come from a master's program that we don't know with poor grades, it's going to help your application less. That may not be a very helpful answer, but you know, we, we look at everything. It's not a it's not a guaranteed entry into the program. It's a plus. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Michaela, you can unmute your phone if you want. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? We can, yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I missed the beginning of it when you were introducing the professors, but I was just, I'm coming from an education background and mm -hmm. looking to move towards um, the aspect of international sector within education. So like a lot of NGOs have education sectors within them. Um, and I just wanted mm -hmm. to know if there was any professors there that like were interested in that, if that was something that the program was interested in. Um, considering like that would probably be my focus of the thesis. So the person who works in education is Liz Cooper in our program. She works in education in East Africa. She has, she's an, an anthropologist and an academic. So her focus is understanding education from, she's not a, a sounds like you're more coming from a practitioner point of view, understanding how to implement education initiatives. She studied how education is implemented in Kenya in particular, which is where she's done all of her, or I think all, all, all of her field research. Uh, and she just brought out a fantastic book on on education in Kenya, and she's very interested in educational reform in Kenya. So obviously that gets that's very similar to things that um, uh, what you're interested in. But it, it, I think it comes in a different from a different direction. The other thing I would say is that students also can take um, classes in other faculties. SFU has a fantastic education faculty. We have a public policy school that's in the same building as we're in. And so it's uh, whereas those would be electives in our program, those, that's a possibility. You can. There's also a possibility of getting people from other programs being uh, co-supervisors. Uh, that's a that's that's I would say rareish. It's not uh, it's it's not common, but it's certainly a possibility. Um, so yeah, I guess that would be that would be my answer. If you want to, you could also email Liz individually if you're interested, or I'll just look her up. She'd be, I think, the person who is most in sync with that. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. See, uh, is there anything else that in the in the comments, Ellen? You think we need to address? Uh... Uh, Kritika has a question about uh, references. Oh yeah. 
Housing uh, stone is the requirement for two academic references. I finished my undergrad in 2010. Yes, yeah, so we've had this before. Um, it, it is preferable to have two academic uh, references. The reason for that is, is it's an academic program. And so we want to get a feel for, and this is, we've had a similar question about the academic, the writing sample, because people says, well, you know, I graduated 10 years ago. Do you really want to write something I wrote 10, 10 years ago? Can I give you something that I wrote more recently? Um, so it's a similar question. I would say it's not set in stone. We're not going to reject you. It's not going to be a desk reject because you gave us, you know, there need to be three references. So, um, you know, that is set in stone. We have accepted people with two um, non-academic references and one academic reference. I think you do need to have really have at least one academic reference. Um, again, I, I'm trying to. I'm not trying not to be wishy-washy about this, but we really do. I mean, let's see. Last year we got 140, 150 applicants. We read through every single application, um, and we looked at every single student. You know, some students require more time because they have a more complex application than others, and so we'll read through that application. We'll look at those references uh, and we'll see if this person, if your candidacy is compelling, and then we'll go to the references and look at the reference. So I don't, it's, it's not going to be a desk reject. Um, and so if you feel that it's going to be a stretch to get two academic references or one of them is not going to reply, one of them may not give you a good reference because they can't remember you. And it, after all, it was 10 years ago. Yeah, then maybe get one of and replace one of those academic references with a non-academic reference. And the same thing I would say for the writing sample. Um, if you graduated 15 years ago and you've been doing policy research since then and producing actually written stuff in the policy research, but it's not, hasn't been for uh, an academic institution, then I think it is acceptable to send us one of those policy papers because it's been 15 years, right? So um, we're, we try to be flexible with these things. I can maybe just add something about, uh, it seems to be a couple of questions about supervisors. Yeah. And in during the application process, um, you know, it's ideal if you can see a faculty member that you, you know, you think you might want to work with and that your research interests align with. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to be a huge factor in your admissions process. Like we, we will, so, and sometimes students change their mind about what they want to work on. And it, it may be that you end up having a supervisor <clears throat> whose expertise isn't exactly in what you want to do, but you know, you can trust that we have all supervised students who kind of go off and do something that's, you know, slightly different from our area of expertise, but we we can still supervise you. We'll still that that's normal and that can happen. Um, so you don't have to, you know, have one of, uh, the faculty members have, you know, promised that we'll be your supervisor. That's not a requirement for the admissions. We do when we're, when we're in, you know, bringing in students, we'd like to ensure that we can supervise you as ideally as possible. So if you want to do something on, you know, quantum physics and political science, like, well, this probably not, <laughs> you know, we, we may struggle, um, but, you know, just to say that if you aren't a hundred percent sure who's going to be the best supervisor for you, that's okay. You can sort of highlight a couple of people that might be the right supervisor and we will make sure that you are paired with the right person. And, and it may not be the person you thought that was, was going to be the right person for you. So that's sort of not something you have to have set in stone ahead in, in the application process. Thanks, Megan. And also, you know, it just as somebody who's reviewed these things before, doing your research into the professors in our department helps as well. It shows us that you're actually interested, that you know how to do, you know, that you're engaging with our program. Uh, obviously, people are applying to many different programs, but if we see that you've gone to the effort and done research and understood, you know, who may align with your interests, even that is also actually helpful for your application. Are there any other questions anybody would like to have addressed? Can I just um, ask a quick question about previous students, maybe that have graduated? Sure. 
Um, is there a space on the website to see like what kind of topics they've chosen um, like previous graduates in the past? What kind of uh, what kind of careers they've chosen or what kind of topics of research they've chosen? Topics of research. So for their extended essays or for their thesis? Correct. Uh, yes, there is some of that. Uh, Ellen, is that, that's correct, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure we've made them public. However, um, there is, if you sort of search through the library, uh, for those who have uh, done the thesis track, it is a requirement that their thesis be submitted to the SFU library. So you could basically just do a generic search, SFU library, international studies thesis, and you'll be able to find every single thesis that's ever been done, including Talia's. Um, extended essays would not be online. Um, and Dr. Jason Stearns did show a couple of um, examples of extended essay topics. Um, and if I may also just kind of ask, like, uh, if possible, uh, Opeyami and Talia do speak a little bit about their topics, if, if that's okay, like just very briefly. That's a good idea. Sure, I can go. Um, so for me, I'm not doing the thesis track. I'm working on two extended essay research. And so my first paper, I'm looking at Nigeria and their oil dependency um, as they are moving towards a more sustainable energy. So I'm looking at the employment sector. So how is that move uh, from uh, away from oil dependency going to affect the employment sector? And so that's what I'm looking at for my first research. And then my second research, I'm looking at property rights ownership in Nigeria, specifically focusing on women and how the legal, the different legal system in Nigeria affects uh, women's property um, rights and ownership. And so those are the two areas that I'm looking at. So very different uh, topics. Um, completely different, but all focused uh, in Nigeria. So those are my uh, two topics. And I just wanted to also add something that this was not the topic I initially wanted to do. And so like uh, Megan was saying, your topic is going to go through so many changes. And once you take the uh, IS 800, like the analytics class, it's going to uh, help you basically narrow down your topic and see um, how you can make your topic better. And so my topic went through so many changes. I, I had to go through so many iterations, but then finally landed on those two topics again. Thanks, Sophie. Talia? Yeah, so like um, Ellen and Manez mentioned, I did the, the thesis track and um, my thesis, um, it actually was um, rooted in education. Um, and I looked at, uh, COVID-19 and the importance of culturally relevant education for Rohingya refugees in Cox Bazaar. Um, and also like Opie Bayou thesis, that, that was not what I went into the program um, thinking I was going to write on. That's not really where I thought I was going to land um, for a while. I had a very different track and then ended up um, here because of a combination of different interests. Um, but my thesis gave me the opportunity to look into that, that practitioner lens, look into international law, look into refugee situations, conflict, international security, and um, and education, which just led me to blend some passions together. But um, it was certainly different than I think any of my cohort um, colleagues wrote on. And there were a, a wide variety of, of topics that came out um, for theirs. And um, yeah. I won't dive into to their topics, but um, that was a, that was what I wrote on. So maybe actually I should have passed this to you and Michaela asked me that question about education. What what is it like for somebody who is interested in education, education policy at at uh, School for International Studies? It, yeah, so I I did um, talk to Liz um, quite a bit in like the early stages when I was in um, IS eight hundred. I focused a lot of my um, policy reports and um, papers on education to kind of try to build this understanding of um, kind of how that works in the international sphere. Um, but my primary supervisor was Megan, and that was um, certainly not within Megan's main focus of research interests, but I uh, really wanted to work with Megan because going back to that piece of kind of why coming into the program, um, Megan's, <clears throat> pardon me, 
um, research focuses and where she looked was where I wanted to go. So I really appreciated being able to have sort of some expertise from some people in the department who had looked at that. And Liz um, actually did her sort of master's thesis research herself had been on uh, secondary education in uh, a refugee scenario somewhere and now I've lost it but yeah that was really her expertise being able to have that but then get the supervisor support from someone who I was just such a good working relationship for me I thought that that combination be able to use different benefits from different faculty members um, was really great but there certainly is that expertise around education in this department um, also Brenda Lyshog, um is a really great resource for being able to kind of blend this idea of refugee situations and education. Um, so she works largely in the undergraduate department is certainly a good resource in here. Thank you. Felix, you have another question. We have a couple more minutes and then we'll wrap it up. All right, thank you once again. So uh, my last question is about the English proficiency um, requirement. Um, from Ghana, like I said, our national language is English, however, my university degree is uh, also in English in Ukraine, but uh, anytime we are trying to apply for admission to any university and they hear you graduated from Ukraine or you are graduating from Ukraine, then they expect you to provide, uh, to write English proficiency. In my case, uh, for SFU, is there any way to try to navigate and then uh, get a waiver for the English proficiency considering the fact that my country where I did my high school uh, medium of instruction was in English and then our national language is in English and in Ukraine where I studied as well. My medium of instruction was in English. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. Ellen, do you have any advice? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, I I also do not understand why certain countries, you know, where <laughs> clearly English is the main language in use, are still required to submit scores. Uh, so I take your point. Uh, you know, very. <laughs> Very well. Um, there is a way to request for an application waiver. Um, we typically do not make that public, and, nor can you find a form anywhere. <laughs> it is sort of like an exclusive form available only to staff. So uh, when, when and if you apply for our program, um, just make sure you reach out to our fantastic um, graduate program assistant, Laura, who is also on this call, uh, for that form. Um, and, you know, and just sort of explain as well, you know, that what you just basically told us in in a note that would really help the admissions committee to understand why that normal requirement is missing from your application um you know and, and to just ensure that you know it doesn't get missed as like an incomplete application basically um and also it would also be helpful if you know because it may not be apparent from your transcripts that your studies were conducted entirely in english for instance like particularly your credential from ukraine so it would actually help if you know someone from that university, like let's say your academic advisor or the manager of your department can also submit a letter uh, confirming this information for us. Felix, Thanks. did you do a bachelor's in Ghana and then a master's in Ukraine or is this a, you're doing your bachelor's in Ukraine at the moment? I'm doing my bachelor's in Ukraine. I see, okay, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, Enoch, um, do you have a, another question? Yes, uh, I have a last question. Um, just like Phoenix, I also did my bachelor's in Ghana, and uh, I completed my master's in France. Uh, my last question is, uh, are there volunteering opportunities that students can engage in just to sharpen their skills and also gain some relevant food-related uh, experience? Yeah, so in addition to the co-op, are there volunteering experiences? I mean, there's also uh, there's students, maybe I shouldn't say this, but students also do work outside of SFU. So there's all kinds of things that, uh, in fact, many of the students work. Maybe uh, Ope or Atalia, would you guys like to take that, that question? Are there any volunteering experiences that you or your colleagues that you've been aware of that students engage in? Um, for other students, I'm not sure, but for myself, I um, actually volunteer so at a nonprofit organization uh, here. And so I found that by myself and I like the work that they were doing. They help immigrants settle. And so I volunteer there once a week. And so I just do that on the side and it's affiliated uh, with my church as well. Um, but I also work, but I 
don't work off campus. So I do a TA job um, and I have also worked as a research assistant as well. So those are the few jobs that I've done and my experience from Ontario. I think that Tayani actually works with an immigration volunteers for an immigration uh, organization as well. I think there's been several students that I've heard uh, yeah. volunteer with. Uh, you know, many of the students are international students, and so they come here and they find it's a net. And for those who also want to work, I think Tayani's interested in working in immigration after she finishes SFU, and it's a good experience for her as well. So I think it's part of it is her passion, and part of it is her career um, as well. I don't know, Atalia, did you want to say something as well? Um, yeah, I don't have a, a great wealth um, knowledge around the volunteering um, in this kind of sector. The volunteering um, that I do with SFU is um, with a nonprofit that's kind of uh, separate from from IS. It focuses more on um, environmental justice and food sustainability. Um, but my work also, I I'm primarily focused on uh, as being a TA and an RA, and um, I appreciate being able to stay focused within the program. But likewise, most of my um, classmates had other jobs of varying degrees, whether they were aligned to the program or not, outside of it. I also wanted to add that I also know of a few people that continue so, some aspects of their job in their current country, so they in their home country, but they're working virtually, but still in Canada. So some people also do that as well, depending on if uh, their job allows them. So they're still working from the current Simon, did you have your hand up? I think it's in the chat and not in the on the screen. But did you want to ask a question? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for the information. So my my question uh, has to do with the research interest. Um. Uh, one of my interests is um. Uh, around conflict, uh, peace building, conflict management, and post-conflict reconstruction. I, I intend to focus on the practical application of, and then the effectiveness of these things in different geographic, uh, geopolitical contexts. Now, my question is, in the, the requirement we have to state the, your research area, here lies the case that uh, I want a different ge a political context. I want to I want to know the particularities in this area. Am I supposed to list um, different areas or just a particular uh, geographical area? You don't have to state any geographic. I mean, I think you should you should say exactly what you just said. You should say you want to do research on what you just laid out. Um, it doesn't have to fit neatly within one area or the other. Just, just express yourself uh, and try to be as, you know, as I said before, try to give evidence of the fact that you have a clear idea of you want of what you want to research, that that's relevant to the expertise of the faculty in our program, which that is myself, Megan, Nicole. We all do work on on, on conflict and security. Um, and uh, and that your research and that it's feasible with what you want to do. Uh, so I think that it's uh, it, you don't have to specify a geographic area. If you're interested in a geographic area, say so, but it doesn't have to be so. Thank you, sir. No problem. And I think we're slightly past the hour. We can stay on if anybody has any questions, but it seems like we've sort of exhausted these questions. I think we're going to post this, if I'm not mistaken, on SFU's uh, YouTube or on the school SFU, the School for National Studies YouTube channel afterwards, if anybody want to go back and if there's something that you missed. Otherwise, I just wanted to thank, uh, especially all of my co-panelists for being here today, OPME and Talia in particular. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and doing this. Talk about volunteering. This is uh, volunteering for 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 the department, so that's very kind of you to do that. Um, Ellen and Megan, thanks for coming along, and uh, thank you for everybody for attending. And hopefully, we'll see your applications come January. <laughs>